Uh, judging by the conversation before breakfast with a few people, maybe there's more to be said about DMT than what we said yesterday. Bef uh, does anybody... I think these things are most... Uh, productive when they're driven by questions rather than somebody jawing away. Is there anybody who wants to ask a question or talk, extend what was said either yesterday or before breakfast this morning? I am concerned about how was one going to, uh, since it's not easy to get it commercially, how does one prepare it in a form that will give you the experience comparable to yours? Well, I'm not a chemist, and uh, I dare say, you know, these things, it's dangerous because these things use reactive solvents and stuff like that. It's possible that out of the same set of plants that the uh, ayahuasca analogs can be prepared, that it, you could concentrate DMT out of Desmanthus elenoiensis or Socotria or Phalaris or something like that. For those of us who aren't second-year students in biochemistry, this is probably uh, the way to go. The other way to go is to try and find a chemist and inspire them to make it. I mean, I know it's not a terribly satisfying answer, but on the other hand, if there were a terribly satisfying answer, there wouldn't be the question, would there? When you talk about concentrating it, natural, just soak it, boil it, Dry off the water. Well, no. The way you would do it, if you were serious, is you would get a piece of apparatus called a soxlet extractor, S-O-X-L-E-T. This is a piece of chemical glassware. And the way it works is it has a bulb. Uh, you, you hook it, you plug it in through a ground glass fitting. You plug it into your solvent uh, vessel, which is sitting on a heater and it vaporizes the solvent. The solvent is carried through a tube past the soxlet and up into a, a uh, condenser. The solvent then liquefies. It drips down onto the sample, which is in a little thing which looks sort of like a, a condom or a toilet paper tube or something. Anyway, it's a, a cylinder with a rounded end that you pack with the sample that you're extracting and the Soxlet, which was undoubtedly designed in Germany um, by somebody very clever, uh, the hot solvent falls on the sample and the sample gets more and more immersed in the solvent. Well then when the solvent is above the level of the little um, sample holding filter tube, there's a little there's a little pipe on the side of the soxlet which leads back down into the, to the vessel on the heater and a kind of siphon automatically cuts in. It's a passive thing. It's just how it's designed. And the, the hot solvent, it goes and it just sucks all the solvent off the sample and drops it back in the lower flask and then the hot solvent begins pure, no, no, nothing is dissolved in it because you know when it, when a solvent vaporizes it uh, leaves all the other materials behind and you run this, they call it refluxing, you reflux the sample for two or three hours and uh, at the end of that time you can be fairly confident if you've chosen your solvent correctly that 99% of what was in uh, is now down in the solvent flask and then you just unhook the solvent flask from the apparatus take that and evaporate it and then you get a pure uh, this is called uh, the liquid then in the flask is called the mother liquor it is a whole alkaloid extract. Every alkaloid in the sample is now in solution in this stuff. And then you can either simply drive the solvent off and you'll get a, a probably a dark brown, reddish brown tar of some sort that you can smoke. 
or if you really are a um, a um, a um, <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. I saw a guy smoke DMT in the forest in Hawaii and one of these metallic bugs came and hovered right over him for the entire trip. Anyway, you can then you have this red tar which you can smoke, but if you want only the DMT and want to separate it from the other alkaloids, then there's a further series of steps, which is you get um, um, chromatography paper. Do you, you know what this is? And you, you uh, pour the solvent into like a petri dish, suspend the chromatography paper so that it just touches the solvent. And do you all know and understand the principles of chromatography? Doesn't it wick up a surface? Yes, it wicks up through the paper, which is very porous, and compounds of different molecular weights will deposit themselves at different levels in the, in the chromatography paper. And then with an ultraviolet light, or sometimes you can tell with your naked eye, it depends on what you're looking for, the DMT will all, like, like say, the DET will be at three and a half inches, the DMT will be at four inches, the monomethyl DMT will be above that. In other words, they fractionate out. And then what you, you do this and you save your chromatography papers. And then when you've, il when you've um, used up all your mother liquor in this way, then you take a pair of scissors and you go through and you cut out the inch wide strip where all the DMT located in the filter paper. And so then you get a, a bunch of little pieces of paper which have are saturated in DMT. Now you put them in a, a clean, um, this thing, this condom-like uh, filter, it looks like a bullet. Uh, you put your chroma, the little sheets of chromatography paper in there, run a solvent through that, and this time when you evaporate off the solvent, you will get uh, a pure enough compound for, for uh, your purposes. I mean, it will be 98, 99% pure DMT. I mean, this may sound like a lot of hassle, but on the other hand, we're talking about the key to the mysteries of life and death here, so <laughs> the effort doesn't seem too heroic. So when you're talking about a solvent, how do you know what solvent to use? Well, um, you, you can look this up in a standard chemistry book. Oh, the cautionary word here is that high molecular weight solvents are flammable. Uh, chloroform, ether, use these things very carefully and always in an open and well-ventilated place and for God's sake don't heat your flask on a gas stove. No open flames allowed. Use the, a hot plate or something like that. Professional chemists have what are called bird nest heaters which are these things which look like bird nests of various sizes that the the flask of solvent just very nicely snuggles down into the bird nest heater and make sure that there are no ungrounded electrical connections around. Ideally it should be done outside where the moving air can disperse the solvent. You don't want to make a fuel of yourself. You, know. you said this morning uh, if since DMT is so difficult to get that psilocybin, uh, if you have more than eight grams, or eight gram at least, that you would get a similar or the same effect? Did I understand? Well, I said that sometimes on high-dose psilocybin, sitting in darkness, breathing and, you know, working it, massaging it over hours, you can break in to these places. But of course, there's a number of extraneous issues here. You have to 
the one thing about the DMT flash is that it's mercifully quick, mm -hmm. so there isn't any time to panic or begin to think about the implications of it. It's just a white knuckle trip through it, and then you're out. Um, I think, I mean, my technique is to try and inspire chemists to make it, you know. And I always tell people, people say, where do you get it? I always say, when you find it, call me first. <laughs> and I, to chemists, I say, you know, when you make it, call me first. And I think this will, uh, this is an effective method for those of us who aren't uh, inspired biochemists. They want us to uh, somehow, under the influence of DMT and to a lesser degree psilocybin, they want us to experiment with language. Hmm. They want us to, I, th you know, uh, they, I mean, this is just my intuition, but I think that we're, you know, yesterday at the end we were talking about how we're on the brink of an ontological transformation of language from something seen to something beheld. I think that we there's some kind of coalescence of the linguistic intent that they want to catalyze. The way I think of these psychedelic compounds is that they are enzymes which catalyze the imagination. Uh, a catalyst, you know, is uh, uh, something which you add to a chemical reaction to speed it up. And I think, you know, that uh, consciousness might well have evolved out of higher hominids given 30, 40, 50 million years but it happened in two million years. And to account for that, I think we have to look for a catalyst of the imagination. And that's what these things do. I mean, they give your mind becomes a much more powerful tool for the forming of associations, for the producing of imagery, for, I mean, your mind becomes like the discriminating wisdom of the sword of Manjushri. You're just able to cut through. Consciousness expansion is what these things were associated with. And, uh, and I, you know, I say in my talks, co it's absence of consciousness that is killing the planet. So if there's something that we can do to accelerate our consciousness, then it seems to me there's almost a moral and political obligation to do that. One thing that I find interesting is that in, in the Amazon, amongst the uh, indigenous shamans or ayahuasqueros, when the, their visions, they have no doubt in their mind that that is a, um, that that is a peak of the spirit world, or that is, a, uh, that is the visions they have of the spirit. Spirit speaking to them or whatever. Like some once I asked him, and I was going to go to saw after we jumped in ayahuasca. He said that he saw a, um, a beautiful woman that was glowing like gold, riding on a horse that was walking on top of the water, and um, she was telling him where the gold was, where to find gold, and this and that. But um, and he was saying that was a puri wadu, the woman of gold, the spirit of gold. And I'm just thinking that other other um, young people who have met that drink ayahuasca, they say that, that they're, they're, they're um, tapalo, they say they're covered, their eyes are covered, they don't see um, like the, the visions that the, that the master ayahuasca will see, which are usually just, you know, like that they're seeing some, you know, beautiful visions of, of you know, spirits telling them things and this and that. And um, maybe it, maybe it's, maybe the fasting and the initiation that the, that the, you know, that the shamans of ayahuasca will go through in order to get to the point where they can see these, these wonderful things is, is um, maybe preparing the body to be sensitive enough to receive, like to be able to get into that state on, on lower concentrations of, of DMT. Maybe it's because we haven't gone through that initiation or that our bodies aren't, aren't subtly um, adapted to that, that, that we may need a higher dose or a more direct concentration. But that, I think that's, I think it's, um, 
like you know, maybe maybe what the, the, what they have developed in order to get to the point to see these things in some way or another, you know, like preparing the body to be able to, to get into that state with you know with the with the constitutions or with the forces available to them. Yeah, I think. Well, it's not something I think. It, it's so that the body is an incredibly sensitive and delicate instrument for interacting with the world. For instance, uh, an example that I like to use, some of you may remember from when you were children, if you got a really good chemistry set, there would be a thing in it called a spintharoscope. Do you all know what a spintharoscope mm -hmm. is? You could make one of these. They're really neat. You could make one. This seems to be the metaphor of the morning. You could make one with the paper tube from the inside of a roll of toilet paper. <laughs> what a spintharoscope is, is it's a, it's a little pipe, usually no longer than this, and in one end it has a lens, and in the other end it has a painted phosphorus screen, like a television set, but just a little piece of cardboard that's got a, some phosphorus painted on it, and right in front of the phosphorus screen is a, a needle which has been dipped in airplane glue, and then the end of the needle has been rolled in the kind of radium that is on a glow-in-the-dark watch, you know? So what you do with the spintharoscope is you go into a closet and close the door and you sit in darkness for about 10 minutes and then you look into the spintharoscope and lo and behold it looks like twinkling stars you see little flashes of light randomly on the other end of the spintharoscope these are get this single photons of light because the radiation from the radium is striking the phosphorus screen and kicking out single photons from uh, from the phosphorus. This is y you, you sitting here, 145 pounds of meat, are looking right at single photons coming into existence. You're looking into the quantum realm. Now they've also done experiments where in a special kind of apparatus, they can, uh, uh, I don't know how they keep the eardrum from bursting, but they, they evacuate air from the ear, and then they can release a single oxygen molecule into the ear, and you can actually hear it bumping against the tympanic membrane. Well, so these kinds of experiments are by way of example that the human body is an instrument with a range of ability that reaches from the quantum mechanical foundations of matter up to when you look through a large telescope out into the galaxy, you know, you can physically have light fall on your eyes that has been traveling for four or five billion years. So the human body is an incredibly advanced instrument for the exploration of nature. And we have, you know, we think you can't learn anything about quantum physics unless you build an instrument 17 kilometers in diameter that costs a hundred billion dollars and provides pork barrel for 20 years for a bunch of weasel politicians. This is just because of our obsession with instrumentality. But what the shaman knows is that the human body is a superb instrument for, for doing this kind of thing. That's why I take, I think the models of reality that emerge out of shamanism are equally on a par with the crowd that's seeking the, you know, the, the top quark and all that other stuff. I mean, these things are pretty airy-fairy stuff. Uh, and usually the argument for them rests on the fiat of some fishy formula. So, uh, Part of the whole thing about psychedelics, I think, is, and I hammer on this all the time, is what I call reclaiming 
the felt presence of immediate experience. This is what you are. You are not Time Magazine or National Public Radio or any of this stuff. The felt presence of immediate experience here, now. Everything else is rumor, innuendo, illusion, factual ricochet. And, and uh, we as a culture have completely sold ourselves out. I mean, we all run around with the idea, little me, what do I know? The guys at SRI, they know. The guys at NIMH, notice guys, guys everywhere. Uh, this is a, a kind of self-definition that is totally disempowering. And shamans, all they trust is their own experience. And they don't even trust their memories of their own past experience. The world is made new each time. So the felt presence of experience is all you'll ever know. It's all you ever can know. So why not empower it? And, uh, and uh, the psychedelics do this. This is why they are so politically subversive. Yeah. A psychedelic person is not willing to be a good citizen or a good anything that is defined by somebody else. I mean, a shaman is a true anarchist, mm -hmm. a truly free, free soul, a real shaman. I mean, there are many, you know, we're always, there's the ideal and then there's like every other profession, uh, accommodations are made, but, but that's the ideal, to be truly in the moment, truly connected to the felt presence of experience. I well, I think cannabis is uh, tremendously interesting and underrated uh, psychotropic. Most people who, sm who smoke cannabis smoke it quite regularly. You rarely meet someone who says, I love cannabis, I smoke it four times a year. <laughs> I've wrestled with this myself because there have been periods in my life, I kid you not, <laughs> when I used to set my alarm clock for three in the morning because I felt unable to go from midnight to 7 a.m. without smoking. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and what happens with that, if you smoke cannabis like that, you're in a kind of permanent state of uh, all you care about are big ideas. You know, I mean, you're not very interested in getting a job or even cleaning your room, particularly. And I think this is completely defensible. I have no problem with that. Uh, my notion of what's ideal with cannabis is if one could have sufficient self-control, the perfect regimen with cannabis is, first of all, get the best stuff you can, and then once a week which is a groan to cannabis lovers, but that's because we're all using it for different purposes other than to plunge to the center of the mandala. But if you only smoke excellent cannabis and you only smoke it once a week and you sit down like on a Sunday evening, unplug the telephone, turn out the lights and smoke as much as you want as fast as you can, it, this is it's competitive with things considered to be much more powerful. I've had experiences because because of the irregularity of the supply. Like I said, it's been about six months now since I've had anything. Well, so you've built up a tremendous charge for it. <laughs> so uh, if I, now, when I get to that point, normally it, the the fear of, of what I'm in front of or whatever is such that you know I put the thing out and I sit there and I white knuckle it you know, trying to maintain consciousness, and it usually takes about 15 minutes before that pineapple fades. And at that point, I just feel like I've been hit by a truck, you know, until everything just fades away. And would it be maybe, I mean, is there any danger in when I see the pineapple? And <laughs> I don't away? think so. I don't think so. I mean, the danger is your own tendency to panic. 
yeah, because I don't know what I have. But the no cannabis was... is posing no problem. <laughs> right, so if I, because I, I wondered about that before and afterwards. What would happen if I had just closed my eyes and like gone into that pineapple room? That's what you should do. I mean, this raises the question about fear, which mm -hmm. always arises. What do you do about fear? People who claim they never experience fear around these psychotropics <laughs> are not fully in touch with the modality of what's going on. Uh, yes, they haven't taken enough. <laughs> and the, what do you do about fear? Uh, well, the best advice I ever heard was in, of all places, uh, Frank Herbert's book, Dune, where, remember, they have this strange drug called Stroon, which allows them to see forward and backward into time and he says in there he says fear comes like a wind and what you must do is you must just let the wind blow it's strange it can't sustain itself yeah. very long and weirdly enough your mind will wander you will actually become bored with being afraid and you'll discover after a few minutes of being terrified that you've now your mind has wandered and now you're not terrified anymore i when i do high dose psychedelics i just root myself to the floor i have a rule of not moving because moving is a kind of distraction and to and you you have to go into it but learning not to be afraid it's easy to say but it's hard to do but you have to discipline the hind brain it's the hind brain that presents you with this fight or flight yeah. thing and you just have to say hey look even this, this is neurocortex activity yeah. shut up already yeah, even in in the state when I'm there um, th there's an awareness that if I something something in me says if, if only I knew if this was okay or not kind of a thing but I think I think it's just the uh, just not knowing it also helps to do the equivalent of praying yeah. I, I mean I when I take mushrooms I say to it I say you know please don't hurt me I'm giving myself to you completely you can kill me if you want but please don't you know I'm and now it's a funny thing of course when you get out into these places you have a whole bunch of if you've done your homework you have a bunch of scientific data to reassure yourself I mean let's take say you take eight let's say you take 10 grams of psilocybin and two hours into it you convince yourself you're dying um, and then you say to yourself but the LD50 of psilocybin is thus and so, and then you in the dark calculate, uh -huh, so I would have had to have taken 900 times more than I actually took to actually kill myself. But this is a, this is a weak form of conjuring because I think most psychedelic people have the faith that actually chemistry represents a lesser truth and the real truth is that the mind can kill you instantly if it chooses to. There's a terrifying passage in Jung, in Mysterium Cununctiones, where he says, the psyche has a thousand ways of terminating a life which has become meaningless. You know, a slip in the hall, a step in front of an oncoming city bus, a moment of inattention, bingo your compost so we have to honor the mind the mind is in control you know um, it's not easy to do this stuff I mean anybody who calls it escapism just is uh, pissing in the wind they don't know what they're talking about I mean this is some of the toughest work that can be done in the ancient world uh, the, uh, the Greeks thought that the escapists were those who would not become inebriated because they were thereby, and they were a type of social outcast of women because they were hiding themselves from everybody else. They thought that only by becoming inebriated and stripping off the veneer of civilized decorum could you thereby see the real person inside, which is of course true. 
And the people that wouldn't do that were looked at with suspicion. And teetotalers in general, uh, I think, should be looked at with suspicion. <laughs> yes, they're, they're frightened, <laughs> anal retentive didacts, and to be avoided in most situations. Uh, it's just the truth of the matter. Civilization is a, a diversion erected to escape the implications of psychedelic nature. You know, we build walls against it. We call it the howling wilderness. We say, there are demons out there. Let's build whorehouses and public baths and hold circuses. And, uh, and at all costs, let us not find ourselves alone in nature with the mystery because it just peels you like a banana. Most people see it, God forbid, we should have to contemplate the true nature of our existence. That's right, and so life is an endless series of uh, narcotic escapes. Television, career, you know, you name it. The main thing is um, the experience I have with ayahuasca and and many times the, the IOS thing will tell you, don't be afraid no matter what you see, because they're just visions and they're just teachers, just for, you know, something else that you're doing, just teachings. But I must admit, I've got to the point where I thought I was going to die, you know, I was just sitting there so hard, but for some reason, somewhere in the back of my head, I vaguely remembered that I did drink something when I'm sitting in the hammock, I think, somewhere, you know, and, um... You're just remembering that, you know, some you know, all of a sudden you know, wake up in the morning and go, oh, I'm still alive. You know, but like sometimes I mean some of the visions are horrifying sometimes when you drink I watch when you see like you know, like people with their skin being stripped off or right. skulls flying at you or blood and, but it always seems to pass. Almost every ayahuasca obsession you have, you always see like both, you know, like beautiful <laughs> things and bad things and, and like death and life and you see and a lot of the times you know you feel like like you you feel like you're alone or something, you feel like you're completely extra great, you feel like that, that you know, no matter how hard you try to grasp onto something that you want, you know what I mean, you just can't, you know what I mean? Well, as you gain experience, you can conquer the fear of death. However, what I think is more of a problem, especially to the true, the really dedicates, is the fear of madness. And this is a much more nebulous and not well understood phenomenon. And uh, you have to, it's incredibly humbling. I mean, you have, it will make you plead for mercy. It will rub your nose in it. People who have hubris can't do this very much or very long or very deeply because it won't tolerate it. I mean, it can, it can break you, it can break anybody. And so the only defense against that is a, a humble, a pure heart. That's what I mean when I say I pray to it and I say, you know, I know I'm an egomaniac, I know I'm, you know, way out of line, please forgive me and please don't hurt me. And then, you know, there are techniques. The most effective technique is sing. Sing. And we Western people, when, when we get in there, the tendency when it gets rough is to clench and to go into a kind of a fetal, you know, this bit. This is not the way to do it. The way to do it is to begin to move oxygen and sound around and just sing your heart out and you will be able to ride it through and it, it will respond to that. The other thing is when I do strong psychedelics I always have cannabis rolled and ready and I you view it as the rudder on the ship and if I find myself sailing into the you know there's one place that I call meat locker land. <laughs> and when I see that come up, I just, I don't wait. I just take a hit of cannabis and begin to sing. And then I can climb. You literally, you climb on the sound mm -hmm. out of the hole toward the light. <laughs> and it's, it's very demanding. I mean, it's very, very... Your whole soul, your whole being rests on being, there is no greater adventure 
I mean, you know, people run around saying, oh, every jungle's been explored, every mountain climbed, you know, on a Saturday night in the confines of your own apartment, you can be Ferdinand Magellan if you wish. I mean, you can, you can see things no human eye has ever gazed on before or will ever gaze upon again. That's how big it is in there. And finally, you just have to trust the stuff and trust your own preparation. Every waking moment should be a preparation for the psychedelic experience. I mean, people should read books, look at works of art, uh, you know, have sexual experiences, travel, spend time. You know, Robert Frost said the secret of life is learning to enjoy people you don't approve of. <laughs> and all of this, all of this, because you, you, you can't possibly be broadly enough educated to meet all the demands of the psychedelic experience. I mean, it is the challenge par excellence. And as is the case, you know, you find that there are doing uh, some spiritual exercises and those are however dedicated you might be to this, or however interested or excited by it and so forth, um, there's also, I said before, that there seems to be no end to human folly, there's also no end to human laziness, and there are all these, uh, what Burroughs called the claims of the aging, nagging, cautious, frightened flesh, that would always prevent you from, uh, I, I, you can talk to yourself, you, uh, I find myself that I have to sometimes say, okay, you know, enough bullshit, it's time to to take something because uh, it, it, the claims of life itself it will just steer you invariably away from you, no matter how interested you are intellectually or emotionally or what kind of ecstatic experience you might have with it. Uh, it's not something that ecstasy is not told. As Watson said, uh, your very soul is seized and shaken until it tingles. And, uh, That's right. And, and if you, like I notice in myself, just in this something as simple as cannabis, if I, if I stop, if I stop, it's like my world just begins to narrow and narrow, and I begin checking my bank balance. <laughs> I begin keeping track of my receipts. I begin wondering about my insurance situation. In other words, you're being I'm turning into a, a jerk, a patsy. Uh, a member of this absurd society that we're living in, and I, I don't want that. I mean, that's why I call these things deconditioning agents, because the, the concerns of the petty bourgeois are not compatible with the psychedelic lifestyle. And, you know, everybody has to find their own balance, but a life lived without spirit is not really, to my mind, a life worth living. And it's... Well, that's one reason why the petty bourgeois is so voraciously against the... Because it, it challenges the, the worth of that style of, of being, worrying about your lawn, for God's sake, and <laughs> spending thousands of dollars on eliminating crabgrass, and, uh, or maybe deciding you need a facelift or some other... I mean, this is just bananas, this kind of thing. You know, another thing, back to the singing... Um, I don't know how many people have experienced with the ayahuasca, ayahuasca um, traditional context, but I suppose that's one thing that I'm here to share with you all. But it's um, every time that the people drink ayahuasca, they always the, the shaman will always sing, and um, and through the song you can see that the whistling is they control what they see, or at least they gain a more kind of a stable position of what they are, what they're seeing. You know, they're just, and if I let them, sometimes I've noticed when the guys are singing, it will be like all of a sudden out of nowhere, like this like huge phoenix will appear right behind the guy. So this little humble old guy will be sitting there with a shake and his rattle mm -hmm. around his legs with these giant snakes and, and you know, like from his rattle and from his arms and his mouth and the lightning bolts will be shooting out in all directions. And then all of a sudden he'll just stop. He'll be sitting there and everything will just like, like you mentioned, like, you know, like close Fold back up. into a little box and then everything will be all like weird. And, Designs but then they start singing, everything just unfolds, mm. and the vision's like crystal clear. 
and like you know certain things happening it's just like through these songs they actually they're able to like you know focus their attention on on you know on um, um, you know, on, on, on whatever they're, you know, they're, they're trying to accomplish, whether it's, you know, serious education or whatever it may be. But also, at um, various times, I've been told, like, that, you know, the morning after we took our last day, we usually talk about what they see and stuff. And my last kind of friends have told me that the spirit world, we're telling him, you, you must be like me, you know. They do what I do, they say. And that was sort of similar to the character saying that these little balancing guys are kind of saying something on that same line. And so... And um, it's not, you know, it's not unusual for these people to always want to be in that state either, you know. It's just like, I know some old by West Coast that church it every other night. And it's like, that's the only world they really want to be in, you know. And it's just like, and at the same time, they never forget the responsibilities of the everyday reality. They're impeccable parents usually, you know, they're always amazing how, how much responsibility they can carry these people. Yeah, the responsibility for the health of the community and the dynamic of the community. But I would think to go to the grave without a psychedelic experience is like going to the grave without ever having sex. It means that a major portion of what it is to be a human being, you just missed the point. And who knows how many opportunities we have to truly be and so, you know, this is, this is a, a birthright. This is part of our heritage as beings in three-dimensional space. And it just cannot be, uh, it's not for governments to mess with it, it, any more than that they should regulate our sexuality or, or anything that is uh, basic to well, human beings. To <laughs> hey, they if it. they could ban sex, they would. It's just they can't figure out any way to get rid of it. If they could, by God, and many have tried to the degree that they could. I mean, look at Puritanism. Look at the whole Western tradition, the incredible anxiety and guilt trips that have been laid. Uh, and even still, in, in current, present-day laws, you look at how many, how many different, they've broken the sex up into so many different acts of sex, and they've actually legislated against which one you're supposed to be able to do and which one you're not supposed to be able to do. Orgasm is a boundary-dissolving phenomenon very similar to psychedelic boundary dissolution, and boundary dissolution is terrifying to the dominator mentality. This is why in French, orgasm is uh, the little death, the petit mort. It's the little death. You know, what a strange approach to the most vital activity that we can do. But it's because, you know, dominators too have to get their rocks off, but they approach it with this tremendously phobic attitude. You know, it's unclean, it's contaminating, it must be done in darkness, it must never be publicly discussed. It's the shameful fact of our fleshiness uh, is just uh, confounding to the dominator, and uh, similarly, uh, the dimensions of, of the mind. And too much time on it, but there seemed to be some appetite for it before breakfast. Is and, and this is, in a way, it's highly idiosyncratic, and there may be people here who violently disagree with me, and if they do, I hope they don't remain silent. I'm... I'm uh, I'm not fragile. I come from Berkeley. We throw chairs when we disagree. Uh, but I thought it would be interesting, or, or I would just like to tell you my, uh, how I see. I always, I think that it's legitimate to try and make sense of things. Some people say, well, you just must accept. You don't try to understand it. But I really, get a kick out of understanding. It's, it's a high in itself. And so I want to know, you know, we here we are, aficionados of the psychedelic experience. We imply that it could change history, maybe save the world. So the real question that has to be answered is, what's so great about it? Are we better people than people who don't do this? Is this really, uh, you know, what's so great about it? 
Or are we no different than Scientologists, Mormons, uh, Hindus, anybody who's got some set of interlocking explanations that make it all make sense for them? And my model for what's going on is uh, a geometric one. I mean, I'm enough of enough in the Western scientific tradition to believe in the primacy of mathematical description, that somehow that cuts deeper than than verbal metaphor. So, I, I believe that consciousness, as we ordinarily experience it, it's evolved over millions of years of pre-human existence and then human experience into a, uh, a device, a detection system to preserve the body. It's a, consciousness is a somatic detect, is a somatic protective adaptation. Uh, you know, s insects exude, uh, toxins, uh, jaguars have claws and teeth. We think. And it's a way to, uh, it's an aid in survival. But it has become that through the um, exegesis and constraints of three-dimensional space in a fairly dangerous environment because our bodies are soft, easily destroyed, easily mangled. And so consciousness has become a protective shell that you, we use to think our way through life and avoid danger. But in and of itself, consciousness, I think, is something else. When you, that's why I say the way to take psychedelics is, and people argue this, I, I think the best way to do it is in a situation of near sensory deprivation, I say silent darkness. And people say, yes, but it's so wonderful to wander stoned in the woods. Yes, it is, but it is never as intense as what can be achieved when exterior input is restricted. And when exterior input is restricted, I think that consciousness literally, literally unfolds into a higher dimension, into a kind of hyperspace or superspace. This is why the shaman can see inside someone's body. You can't see inside someone's body unless you're in, an, in a higher dimension. If you're in a higher dimension, the inside and the outside of someone's body is equally accessible. Do you all understand what I mean? Mm -hmm. That if you're in hyperspace, there's no such thing as a locked box, and there's no such thing as the inside and outside of a body. Similarly, the shaman can see who stole the chicken, or the shaman can see who sent the, the virote, the tensak, the poison dart, because, in fact, the shaman transcends linear time and space. One definition of who, what a shaman is, it, and the mushroom told me this, I said, what is a shaman? And the mushroom said, a shaman is someone who has seen the end. No hesitation. A shaman is someone who has seen the end. What that means is that here we are down in three the three-dimensional space-time matrix with the, the conscious mind bound into the body. But when we basically anesthetize or de-emphasize the body and allow consciousness to unfold to its own parameters, then it obviates time and space. It obviates the inside and the outside of things. It is an authentic journey into a superspace that can be mathematically analyzed if necessary. And what came up before breakfast this morning was, you know, I've been grappling with this DMT thing since 1967. And uh, uh, 
the the puzzling part of it, the challenging, the epistemically challenging part of it, are the entities. I mean, that's big news. I mean, a hallucination is one thing, an intellectual insight is one thing, but beings? I mean, that's that's something quite of a different order. Well, let's try and be, if not scientific, at least r have a certain rational economy to our thinking on this subject, and let's take it seriously. Let's say that, yes, we agree that on DMT, in the flash, one encounters beings that have a great affection for humanity and a wish to communicate with them. Now, uh, a, a spectrum of explanation offers itself in line with the current obsessions of our culture. The first thing we might suppose is, my God, these are extraterrestrials that are somehow available through this alteration of consciousness. Now, extraterrestrials are a hypothetical construct. Nobody has ever trotted one around. The people who believe in extraterrestrials without question mm -hmm. invariably vibrate with the same kind of narrow-minded, uh, opinionated aura that you get with Christian fundamentalism or anybody who has all the answers. Uh, I think it's very unlikely that these are extraterrestrials because, you know, the distances between the stars are incomprehensibly vast and the time that is involved is incredible. And, you know, of course, there could be instantaneous technologies, but I said we would have a certain rational economy in our explanation. Okay, so extraterrestrials, that's one possibility. Next possibility, um, we know from those of us who are aficionados of science fiction that within the 20th century the concept has been booted around of what's called a parallel continuum. In other words, that somehow there are worlds different from this world that lie side by side to ours and that you can... Uh, in some, in that hypothetically through some technological innovation or through magic or something, you can contact these parallel continui. However, no one has ever convincingly demonstrated the existence of this. Well, so then if we use what is called Occam's razor, which is a, a very uh, respected logical um, a, a limitation used in the formation of hypotheses to keep things from getting too baroque. Occam's razor simply says hypotheses should not be multiplied without necessity. In other words, keep it simple, stupid. Uh, if it doesn't have to be complicated, why complicate it? So if we try to apply Occam's razor, to the entities encountered on DMT, then it seems to me far more likely and nevertheless incredibly challenging to our conceptions of reality, far more likely that, than that these entities are extraterrestrials or dwellers in some hypothetical parallel continuum, a more economical hypothesis would be that these are souls. After all, they love us, they're very interested in us, and they seem to be somehow right here. They are souls. And what you break into is an ecology of souls. Well, now, we, I think, far more than most of us realize, have bought in to the um, ur premise of materialism, which is that when you die, you become compost, and that's it. But a crowd like this 
we just run around constantly giving praise to shamans and shamanism and saying, you know, they're so far out, they cure, they know more than we do, uh, they have a better connection into nature. Well, then, when we ask the shamans, what do they say about these entities? Well, they say that they're ancestors. They say, well, they're, it's the spirit world, they're ancestors. We do all our magic through the ancestors. Ancestors is a tremendously cleaned up concept. What they're talking about is dead people. An ancestor is a dead person, for crying out loud. Who ever heard of an ancestor who wasn't a dead person? So if we have such respect and reverence for the insights of shamanism, then we are going to have to take seriously a fairly confounding notion to our materialist point of view, which is when you smoke DMT, you encounter souls that, in fact, uh, death has no sting. <laughs> And that the metamorphosis of conscious life occurs beyond the grave. And I find I resisted this for years. I just pushed it away as too weird. Better they should be extraterrestrial mean <laughs> traders come here to do X, Y, and Z. Better it should be a parallel continuum. But shaman worldwide insist that they are the ancestors. What can we bear, bring to bear against that? 500 years of scientific rationalism that has produced a neurotic world population and a toxified planet. If, you know, this is where the humility comes in, I think. We have to seriously consider the possibility that uh, as Marcia Layad says in his wonderful study, Shamanism, the Archaic Techniques of Ecstasy, he says, the shaman is one who can pass through the same gate that the dead pass through every day, but the shaman returns. The shaman returns. Well, this just raises the hackles on the back of my neck, because now we're beginning to get answers. This is not instant psychotherapy. This is not an elaborate form of self-indulgent play. This is getting down to the most bedrock stuff there can possibly be. We are gaining insight within our own intellectual constructs into what lies beyond the grave. And this is the, in all the science fiction scenarios of what the future held, colonies on Mars, physical immortality, nanotechnology, star flight, nothing could be as confounding to 20th century secular civilization as the discovery of what lies beyond organic life. And maybe it's because I had, uh, I've always been uh, obsessed with Lepidoptera and have spent many years observing them, but I see now, Jonathan showed last night the statue of Xochipilli, the butterfly there. The butterfly, even to the Greeks, was the symbol of psyche. The butterfly is the symbol par excellence of metamorphosis. And so I think that what we are on the brink of learning as a culture is that our terror of death is a misapprehension of how the universe works. I mean, we're like caterpillars contemplating pupation and saying, my God, nothing could be worse. No longer will I chew on the cabbage leaves. No longer will I spend my time moving around on the underside of foliage. Instead, something horrible and unimaginable. I don't want to become a chrysalis and lie still and exhibit no sign of life. 
But then, and the caterpillar never notices, unless there are shaman caterpillars, <laughs> that what are these miraculous creatures moving through the air in a cloud of exultant iridescence? It is the human soul and the mystery of human becoming. And this, to my mind, Dahlia challenged me after the talk the other day where we got into some pretty existential stuff. You know, what is the basis of hope? The basis of hope is that the, the teaching of teachings of shamanism is that death is an illusion of the material mind and that life is, as the Buddhists, the Dzogchen people, the shamans, as all the old, old, earth-centered, rooted philosophies teach, life sh must be a preparation for the transition to another dimension. Now, I, this, I, God, I never thought I would have come to this place. You know? <laughs> I mean, I fought my way free of the Catholic Church, and it's clearly not necessary. I, I'm fascinated by Timothy Leary. He's a, he's a personal friend of mine. There is not an iota of spiritual sensitivity in the man. I mean, he will tell you this. Uh, you've probably all heard him say, God, fuck God, you know. I mean, it's something he loves to do in front of audiences. Uh, he's a behavioral psychologist from Harvard, even 40 years and 10 trillion mi micrograms later. But uh, uh, I, I think that this is the big news. And remember when I said the other day in our heavy discussion that we have to learn to die with dignity. I didn't mean just fold your tent and sink into the quicksand embracing the idea that there's a noble destiny in becoming ant food. I meant uh, we should realize that life is an opportunity to prepare our vehicle for transition into eternity. And the urgency that is now coming out of the plants and out of uh, all of this is because, remember how I said 95% of all species have become extinct? Apparently nature is a mechanism for producing extinct species. I think that uh, consciousness is the precondition for immortality. And that, I mean, and I'm just basically, I'm this is the name of this talk is what I've learned from psychedelics or something like that. <laughs> that the, the purpose of life is to become conscious and to strengthen consciousness. Uh, William Blake has, he says that, he says after death there is a golden spiral into eternity but not all can traverse the golden spiral. And then he says, if you fall from the golden spiral, then there is eternal death. Well, I choose to believe that if you attain incarnation as a human being, then you are a caterpillar, and you do have then a, a very, very good or perhaps a hundred percent opportunity for making this transition. And the urgency that surrounds this now is I, I, I share all of your concerns for the environment, for the starving, for the AIDS infected, for all the horror around us. But I also believe nature has a higher wisdom than any of us can generate or bring to bear and that in fact nothing is wrong nothing is wrong everything is on track and that we are in fact headed for extinction as three-dimensional animals and that uh, and that's why shamanism and the archaic revival and the discovery of the old, old knowledge, knowledge which was useless inside the enterprise of civilization, now has meaning because the enterprise of civilization is finished. 
Merciliad in another book, a book called Myth, Dreams, Myths, Dreams, and Mysteries, has a wonderful passage where he compares Western civilization to a dying person. And he says, when a person dies, their entire existence flashes in front of them. And when a, when a global culture dies, everything is flashing in front of us. Every codex will be published. Every archaeological site will be dug up and displayed. Every philosophy will be trotted out and explored because we are in the delirium that precedes transition into the next dimension. And if we can, through the use of psychedelics, create a shamanic understanding where, you know, and I think that's what we're doing, that's what this circle is, but millions of people, billions of people, need the uh, calming assurance that comes from experientially verifying the existence beyond the grave. And I think that at the end of history, this is what will happen, that very shortly the, the instability built into the system is going to transform material existence beyond all imagining. The culture, the, the global civilization is dying there are too many problems. They're accumulating. You have to be blind to not realize that this is really, in fact, the end of the road. And that it is, um, you know, the ozone hole, the toxic pollution, the toxification of the ocean. We can't pretend that these things are easily reversed by simply recycling or something like that. No, instead of this clutching to keep it all like it is and say, oh, no, no, please, no future, please, no future, we have to say, okay, deep breath. It's like that first wave of psilocybin when you feel it sweep over you or ayahuasca and you realize, you know, my God, my God, here it comes, I've done it this time. <laughs> well, we've done it this time, folks. We have been planning human mass suicide for 15,000 years. Not a moment was not dedicated to this goal. And now it's upon us. And it's a, a cause for great rejoicing. We will go off into hyperspace the planet will heave an enormous sigh of relief. <laughs> and if it can come back from an asteroid impact that leaves nothing larger than a chicken standing around, then I dare say in 50, 60,000 years, you know, the glaciers will run, the jungles will restabilize, the ocean will cleanse itself. And as the I Ching says, no blame, no blame. The metaphor that we have to keep in front of ourselves, you know, you, you all know the cliché uh, ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny, right? Do we all understand what this means? No. It, it, it's, it means it's something that embryologists in the 19th century created, and I think it's fairly profound. It's that a fetus, a human fetus, uh, recapitulates the entire history of evolution oh, on this okay. planet. It begins as a tiny one-celled organism, it becomes a fish, it becomes a reptile, it becomes a mammal, it becomes a human being, but the part of the recapitulation of phylogeny that we've ignored is extinction. For, for a million years we have been uh, afloat in the gentling amniotic ocean of the planetary environment. Imagine the fetal crisis of birth. You exist as a fetus inside your mother. Food is delivered through the umbilical cord. Oxygen delivered the same way. Endless space, weightlessness. The dream, paradise. All needs are met. And then, 
something begins to go wrong. <laughs> the walls close in. The and you begin to be propelled into the birth canal. Strangulation. Death. The fetus must know at that moment incredible fear. Everything is going to be destroyed. The world is ending. Yet, how could the fetus at that moment imagine Hieronymus Bosch or nuclear physics or global politics or star flight or any of these things? We are now in the birth canal of a new ontological order of human existence, and the walls are closing in. There's no going back. The amniotic ocean, the, the unpolluted, endless frontier of a game-rich planet, forget it. We've been in the birth canal for 10, 15,000 years, and now we're approaching transition, the most violent part of the birthing process. and. All you can do is scream unless you have some superordinate knowledge of what is going on. The shamans, shamans in the rainforest, shamans among us, and as a goal for each of us, must act as the midwives to a new order of existence. There's no going back. We've burnt this scene to the ground. And the womb is stretched, the womb is traumatized, but it can recover. And But the, the child and the mother must be parted. Again, the metaphor of pregnancy. If a pregnancy is somehow um, doesn't, if the birth is not smooth, if the child is not parted from the mother, toxemia sets in. And then both, and then you have a real crisis. The life of the mother, the life of the child, everything is in danger. This is the re, this is the real problem. I don't think we've reached that place yet. I think that we'll go fairly smoothly into hyperspace, but I think the emergence in the last 20 years of uh, masses of human beings taking psychedelics, masses of human beings talking about getting in touch with the spirit, talking about a, a new shamanism, an archaic revival. This means we are very, very close to seeing the light at the end of the tunnel. And it's a radiance, the, the, the meaning and the depth of which cannot be told, because we are, after all, being born into a higher dimension. But if we believe in the dynamics of nature, if we believe in the rightness of being, then there should be no anxiety. There should be no alarm. This is what psychotherapy and shamanism and all these things exist for, is to spread the truth about the situation so that we don't clutch and we don't hold on and spread panic and hysteria. Uh, and that's what I've learned from psychedelics. Uh, to get to the spirit, I can't see for myself, I can't see bypassing the heart, um, but anyway. Well, don't you think that, that the collapse of everything familiar is going to open our hearts? I mean, look at what AIDS has done. Look at what our, the information we have about the rainforest or the pictures of Somalia. I mean, the the most open-hearted of us open first, but before this is over, every one of us will probably bury the dead and walk through, I mean, hell, and it will open the heart. It can't fail to open the heart. I mean, when a friend dies in your arms, maybe the first time it doesn't work, but the second, the third, the fourth, I mean, we are going to get it sooner or later and it's it's bigger than all of us i mean it's just so big and it's always been there in miniature in the phenomenon of our own deaths but we didn't we don't look at that but you know if you will contemplate your own death your heart will open 
I mean, the truth that I've learned from psychedelics, to put it into bumper sticker form, mm -hmm. if that's the way to think of it, mm -hmm. is uh, this is the hardest truth there is. This is the distillation of 50,000 years of, of, of nomadic hunting and orgies around the campfire and rockets to the moon and, and the whole thing. It can be summed up in a single phrase. Nothing lasts. Nothing lasts. Everything is changing into something else. Heraclitus said this. He said, Pante Rea, all flows. Uh, we flow into this world, we inhabit it, and we move on. Nothing lasts, not your career, not your fortune, and finally not even your own sweet self. Everything is replaced. And if we can open ourselves to this by the heart, by the, by the mind, I mean, there's all ways, then we will find the dignity to, and, and this is not about being born in the generation at the end of the world. This is something that would have worked at every moment in history. After all, Heraclitus lived 2,500 years ago. This is the truth of true maturity. Nothing lasts. I mean, every time I, I take a trip or, or eat a fine meal or make love or visit an art gallery, I feel the transience of it, and that enriches it. That's the heart dimension, is the poignancy of knowing that this too shall pass. This too shall pass. You know, the earliest piece of poetry in English is called Deor's Lament, and it begins, Nine winters we Elthiau held Marenglenberg. That now is gone, this too shall pass. It was a song sung by a poet to a king somewhere in, in France in, in, the, in the 10th century or something like that. Everything is in transition, and uh, the material body can resists this truth because the material body understands that if it passes then it will be replaced by something which it can imagine and that that triggers a, an anxiousness but i think this is what psychedelics teach that uh, nothing nothing lasts and if we can incorporate that and live it we will live every moment to its fullest people who are hiv positive they get to walk around with the knowledge that nothing lasts, and in a way they are privileged, because after all, any one of us could be bitten by a snake today and die or have a tree fall on us or be run over by a bus. We would have missed living in that heartful dimension where you know that you, you, you too will, uh, will move from the scene and make way for something else. Terrence, if I could use the example of, because I've been in the HIV community a lot, that when a good friend of mine was dying, I took both my sons to his deathbed because they really felt that they needed to be there. And um, we stayed with my friend you know, for a few hours and I said, touch him, this is the body. And, we, and the next day we came back and he died. And I'm part of a tradition where we're all trying to learn how to make that transition beautiful. And so they had his body the next day with painted with feathers. And they kept it in the house for almost uh, almost two days, actually, while people came and they went through whatever they had to go through. And my youngest son, Jacob, um, came up and he was very quiet. And I said, I want to check in with you. This is very intense. You know? And I said, what, what do you feel? And he said, he went inside me. You know, and it was something that I've been experiencing more and more now. This internal turning it was like something I shared with you about a peyote ceremony where I felt this bird flying around inside me and then I went inside and there was a whole uh, environment that was pristine and I was crying and crying and, and the voice kept saying, we're not extinct, we came inside. You know? There's a whole environment. Somehow, I mean, I don't understand it yet and I think psychedelics, like you say, are some kind of bridge prepare us for that because I know in my own experience of going through so many of my friends' death, you, know, you see a man who's vital, 25, beautiful man, turn into an Auschwitz-like 
character of this little fetal being in a bed. I mean, it's terrifying. But at the same time, you go through that enough, and it's almost like a rehearsal for resurrection. Just yeah, William Blake said, um, nothing is lost. Nothing is lost, and I, I really believe that. I think we only move on. But William Blake, you know, this isn't the opposite thought, but it's an adumbration of it. He said, what is the price of experience? Is it bought for a song or sold for a dance in the street? No, it is purchased with all that a man hath. His children, his wife, his home. And that's the truth of it. One of the things that you learn on psychedelics that you haven't mentioned at all that ties into this a lot is the time wave zero. And you haven't mentioned it here at all. Uh, you, is that a different Well, statement? the... Uh, the um, and it, the reassurances of higher mathematics, I figured I would spare you. Well, would you favor us with... Uh, I, I've always been interested in where you've drawn historic parallels to uh, kind of checking in on where we're at in well, I, I, you know, I said a shaman is someone who has seen the end, mm. and I mean that on many, many levels, but um, for some reason, and I don't know why, although Jonathan said something last night, I'm not sure I can quote it exactly, but he can help me, Pasteur said chance favors the informed mind the prepared mind, the prepared mind. chance favors the prepared mind I, I my trips have taken the form of a mathematical modeling of reality that incorporates all of these emotional perceptions into the idea that um, you know, there is a natural order to time, and in the same way that a pregnancy has a, a, a describable unfolding, human history has a describable unfolding, and we can, if we pay sufficient attention to the, to the content of the psychedelic experience, and if we have prepared our mind, and in this case it happens to mean by gaining familiarity with a previous system for describing time, the I Ching, that the, the ecology of souls beyond death can actually give us a map, and, and a map of history showing where it begins, where it climaxes, and where it ends. I think that to some degree the Maya had this, I think great civilizations have this sense of an inner dynamic, and uh, I think it's built into the DNA. You know, in, in Moby Dick, when Starbuck and Ahab are discussing the pursuit of the whale, and Ahab says to him, he says, this story was old 10,000 years before the oceans rolled. I think this story was old a million, million years ago, and that we are on schedule, on track, and if and it's our job to prepare our minds and then to uh, make a kind of peace with it. And the, the, what the psychedelics offer is nature is offering reassurance and saying, if you will but turn away from the masturbatory activities of secular civilization, all nature seeks to speak to you of the completion, of the plan, of the glorious hope that lies ahead. The Irish, a perverse race, if there ever was one, <laughs> have a wonderful toast, and it is may you be alive at the end of the world. <laughs> and uh, 
I think we've we we've we've won the jackpot. <laughs> you know? We we get to be the most privileged generation of all the thousands and thousands stretching back and back and back because we get to we have ringside seats for a drama that was ancient before the ice melted. Let, let me, as long as, let me try and get a, off this heavy thing for a minute and tell you something about the Irish that I think sheds a little bit of light on DMT. Uh, as yes. you, as you know, the Irish have, a, 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 if we think in cultural stereotypes, uh, two things that are associated with the Irish invariably are, uh, intoxication and little people. And uh, some of you may know uh, that in Christian theology there is the concept of purgatory. And purgatory is uh, where unbab the souls of unbaptized children are thought to go. And it's exactly like heaven except that you don't get the sight of God because you were died unbaptized. I mean, this is just their dogma. Well, I always assumed that uh, that the doctrine of purgatory arose probably at the Council of Nicaea, or I just hadn't given it much thought. And then I was asked to write an introduction to a reprint of uh, Y. E. Evans Vence's book, The Fairy Faith in Celtic Countries, which is a wonderful ethnographic study of fairy beliefs in Brittany, Scotland, and Wales. Mm -hmm. And I had not read the book since I was 14, so I read it again, and I learned there, to my amazement, that um, the doctrine of purgatory was created when Patrick arrived in Ireland to convert the pagan Irish to Christianity, he found this fairy faith just very strong and it was a belief that when you die you you go into a dimension very nearby in fact all around and you continue in some kind of existence having parties and drinking under hills and making magical objects and stuff and uh and the belief in Ireland is that certain people can see the fairies. If you have what's called the eye, you can see the fairies. And the people who have the eye say they're all around. They're everywhere. There are thousands of them. They just fill nearby space. Well, Patrick told, he told them then, he created the doctrine of purgatory. And when he successfully converted the pagan Irish and returned to Rome and filed his reports, uh, they were so impressed with the success of his missionary work that they made it general church dogma, and then they used it very successfully in the Slavic conversions in the East. So purgatory is really fairyland shoved into an uncomfortable accommodation with Christian dogma, but it is the, 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 the basis of both beliefs is the same phenomena which are revealed under DMT, the presence of a nearby space filled with entities with an affection and concern for humanity. And, you know, I said yesterday in talking about DMT, they show you objects, they offer you objects. Well, the myth of the fairies is that they are master artisans, gold workers, and, uh, and capable of, uh, of producing magical objects. So I, I just think that Western civilization took a bad... T that, you know, when Alaric the Visigoth and that crowd and he's always called a barbarian. He was a barbarian, but he was a Christian barbarian. He was not some pagan. Uh, Jonathan mentioned last night that um, Valentina Wasson was the first to suggest that psychedelics be given to dying people. Great idea. Who isn't dying? 
you know, who, who isn't dying? Sigurd. Uh, I missed the, um, uh, I arrived a little late, I was wondering, you haven't told your, um, Shimon of Purple Flynn story, have you? <laughs> Is there another session with me? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Promises, promises. <laughs> Let, let's save that for another time. That's basically the story of how I came to all these conclusions. You're, you're getting it all chopped up and in some kind of cubist pastiche, but before it's over, <coughs> we'll get through it all. Uh, I'd like to say something else, too, on the same kind of line of track, just most of the things that, I, that I'm sharing with you about the Ayahuasca and the Amazon are from first-hand accounts because I really I actually have never read much literature or anything of the sort. And, um, but one thing, that, one thing that a lot of the shamans say there, even, even many of the mestizo shamans that, that live you know, in or near town, they say that, um, especially the shamans, once they, when they die, they're, they're, um, they turn into a jaguar or a boa. And um, I've had many of the... Uh, some of the shamans, you know, uh, children tell me that, yeah, when our grandfather died, we went back to his grave, and there's a big hole, and he wasn't there anymore. And, and you hear many accounts, like, sometimes if you're out in someone's territory, and you see jaguar tracks, you say, oh, yeah, this is my grandfather, and he turned into a jaguar. And um, so they have a strong belief that, that uh, and that's, that's one of the highest animals on the food chain, a jaguar, to be reincarnated into a jaguar would be quite a treat, I suppose. <laughs> um, but it's not everyone in you know, the tribe that can be coming into the jaguar. It's just the shamans, the people that prepare themselves for this equipment in this life. And it's the whole, the whole life is a series of preparations to die and turn into the jaguar. One shaman told me that, he told me, well, I'd die if I didn't have so much responsibility to kill this life because there's not so much hunting anymore. And if I was a jaguar, it would be a lot easier to always have my stomach full. <laughs> <laughs> Sure, let me ask you a question. Uh, in, in, that, in that tradition, you die and if you reincarnate as a jaguar, what happens when that jaguar dies? Where does that guy go? Oh, no. But aren't they sort of spirit jaguars? They're not <laughs> simply jaguars. Yeah, they're true. magical. Yeah. They're interdimensional jaguars. Uh, for example, the Warani, they call the jaguar Mingi. But um, the jaguar that's reincarnated, like or an ancestor that's reincarnated in the form of a jaguar, is Bagai. And they can't distinguish, the jaguar is a very sacred animal, because they can't distinguish the difference between Mingi and Bagai. Bagai, the spirit of a reincarnated ancestor, Mingi, just the ordinary Joe Jaguar. There's so many of them out there. <laughs> <laughs> Joe Jaguar. <laughs> So anyway, that's the bit. <laughs> <laughs>